Um, my um, wife said that, uh, uh, Dan, you have a tendency to be sometimes a little too gentle, a little too uh, um, quiet and kind uh, in, in your thoughts. And, and she said, this is an important message. And I think it is an important message. We talk about stewardship. And, and stewardship, it's easy to say, that, and, and I was raised with this, that stewardship is about giving. It's about how much we give and about, well, we should at least give 10%. Uh, I was raised with that. I was taught that. I practiced it uh, uh, via the directions of my parents. It's become a habit. It's part of, of, uh, uh, part of my, my lifestyle. But you know what? I, I want to I step away from that this morning and say, you know, stewardship isn't about giving 10%. Stewardship isn't about giving 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent. Stewardship is about something that is a lifestyle, a choice, a decision that we make. Uh, Cheryl read the passage of scripture that... uh, at the beginning to the kids if you if you want to follow me you must deny yourself the things that you think you want computers you must pick up your cross and follow me the person who wants to save his life will lose it and she who loses his life for me will find it look does it make sense to truly become successful but then to hand over your soul what is your soul truly worth the, the passage of scripture is follows the story of uh, of Peter uh, um, saying to to Jesus, um, "Well, I'll, I'll, we'll we'll follow you," and 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 Jesus saying to Peter, "Get behind me, Satan!" And and basically what he was addressing was the issue of okay, so it's easy to have rhetoric. It's easy to have language. But when we're asked to put the language into a lifestyle practice, are we willing to make that next step? I was watching a video this past week that I thought I was going to show this morning, but it was a little too long. It's a video that that talked about a a football player. Uh, It was in 2011. He had... uh, Played for one of the major universities in in the states, and and uh, he was uh, destined to become a pro football player. His junior year, he had uh, some damage done to his arm at one at one tackle, and uh, and so he got laid up and had to do surgery. And so he had a a time of struggling because football was so important to him, so valuable to him. He was planning on going into the NFL. He was planning on making it a career. And all of a sudden, this damage came along and it sidelined him. Well, he worked back into sidelining and, and he worked back into a position where his arm was ready to play the next year. But he said during that time, he said, I was reminded of the fact of what Christ had, uh, had uh, done for me and I, and, I, and I renewed my relationship to Christ and my understanding that I don't understand, but God understands. And putting his uh, and putting his trust into God, so he went back his senior year to play football, and again, uh, as he had been for the first three years and all the way through high school, he successfully played the position of linebacker very well, to the point where he was pursued by four or five different professional teams that wanted him to come and play for them. And on the eve of the draft. He made a decision. In the final game of the season, he went to his buddies and and his uh, co-players and said, I've decided I'm not going to go into the NFL. I've decided I'm going to forego that opportunity because I believe God is calling me into the ministry and God is calling me and directing me to seminary. 
needless to say, that was quite scandalous on the part of his friends. And what are you, nuts? You're going to give up football and go to seminary? Don't you realize how much money you can make in football? And how much publicity and how much notoriety you can have in football? And then you can have a, make a world of difference in what you can give and what you can share with the world around you? What are you doing? Why are you giving up football for the sake of seminary? I suspect that if I would have been with uh, this young man in the process of choosing, I would have said to him, boy, you know what? What a great opportunity. You'll be able to live out the kingdom of Jesus Christ before your, co- of your players before the, and before the world. You'll be able to tell the gospel in, a way, in, in, a, in a circles that you wouldn't otherwise be able to tell it. I probably would have joined them in, in that chant of this is an opportunity that God is giving you. But as I listen to the rest of his story, and as I listen to him talk about having given up the opportunity to play football, and as he began to st- share some stories about what happened after he decided not to go into football, how God provided uh, the means by which he could go so he wouldn't have to pay for it. How God provided a full-time job for him so that he could work through seminary and not have to worry about making income. About how he had the opportunity and occasion to go and visit in people's lives and to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ in a transforming, life-giving way. People who he would never have had an opportunity to share with otherwise. And I guess I would say this young man chose correctly. You know, if you want to talk about stewardship and relationship to how much you can give, this guy blew it. If you want to talk about stewardship in relationship to how many people he could share the gospel with because of his position in the NFL, this guy blew it. But if you were to ask him what God wanted him to do, he made the right choice. There's a passage in Corinthians that says that the fool, that the, that the, 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 the foolishness of the the, wise, the wisdom of God is foolishness. To, uh, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. When we look at, at our lives and we look at the, the things that happen in our lives, we can look at them and say, wow, what a great opportunity to be invested, to do this, to do that. What a great opportunity to do. And, th- and when we look at the world standards and the world's idea of what we should do, sometimes that's not what God wants us to do. Being a good steward isn't about how much money you give. Being a good steward isn't about how much how much uh, prestige you can bring to the kingdom. Being a good steward does not matter how much power and position you can have because of because of your being a good steward is about finding the right focus. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your time. God doesn't need the things that we can come, the position of power and control that we can present. God doesn't need any of those things. What He needs is our hearts. The passage that was read by Monty is a passage that tells a story about a farmer. A farmer must have been a good farmer. And he decided that uh, one year God was good to him. He had a bumper crop. Matter of fact, it was such a bumper crop that, that he began to look and he says, Whoa, I've got a problem here. I haven't got enough space to, to store my 
my grain. And so he said to himself, well, you know, I guess the best way to resolve that is to tear down the old barns and build new. You know, that isn't too strange in our culture, is it? I look around and I say, I see perfectly workable buildings being destroyed so they can put another building in. I see, uh, uh, I see churches that can function very well in the, in the, in the, in the tool that, that, that they have been given to, to worship and, and to celebrate in, but instead they build million dollar palaces. And they would say they're doing it for the kingdom. And my response is, are they doing it for the kingdom or are they doing it because that's what the world says we should do? We need to build bigger. We need to do greater. We need to succeed more. We need to get out there and convince people that they need Jesus. We need to wow them with our music. We need to wow them with our worship. We need to wow them with our programs. And the world says, if we're going to be effective, this is the way we need to do it. And there are a lot of churches today that are very successful. But sometimes I wonder if sometimes the church is, in, is successful in spite of God. And what God doesn't have and what He wants to have is the hearts of those who gather to worship. And we get so consumed with building a program or building a church or building a denomination or building this or building that. We get so concerned about looking successful or about playing the right role that we have building campaigns to say we need your money so we can build a building. We have campaigns, we, we have a stewardship campaigns to say, look, we need you to make a pledge next year. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't want anybody walking out of here saying, I'm not saying you shouldn't do a pledge. I love it if you did a pledge. But, and this is going to probably get me in trouble by some. God and His kingdom don't need to squeeze money out of people. They don't need to manipulate people into doing programs or into doing this or doing that for the church. You see, God isn't into manipulation. God is into a desire for the heart. It wasn't wrong for this man to be, build bigger barns. It wasn't wrong for this man to, to want to expand his business. It, was, it isn't wrong for this man to be rich. It isn't even wrong to eat, drink, and be merry. That isn't, that isn't the wrong thing. All those things are fine. But when we leave God out of the center of what we do and why we do it, when we take God from where He belongs and put Him where we, where we can easily manage Him or, or stay safe, when we can take God and, and put Him over here and celebrate Him when it's convenient, but when it's not so convenient, we can live our own lives. That's where stewardship no longer is stewardship. That's where passage of scripture says that um, we seek after what we want and we give God lip service. And I, I got to confess to you when my wife told me I wasn't harsh enough or I haven't been strong enough in some of these issues, I didn't want to hear it. I would rather sell you a gospel that's comfortable. But I'm beginning to realize God doesn't call us to be comfortable. God calls us into a relationship with, with Him 
and that our lives should not be lived for ourselves, but our lives should be lived for the glory of God. And that the money that I gather on a, through my work or through my investments, that money is a gift from God, but it's a gift from God so that I can give back to God. And when I preach, I preach not for myself, so that Christ might be glorified. And I confess before all of you, I am as guilty as anyone sitting in the pew about being sidetracked and distracted from keeping Christ at the focal point of my meaning and purpose in life. But my heart, my heart in the midst of my failures longs for people to see a Christ who gives us life. What is your faith investment? Is your faith investment comfortable? Is your faith investment something that's there but maybe a little bit off the side? Or is your faith investment the essence and the core of who you are? The person who wants to save his life must lose it. And she who loses her life for me will find it. Look, does it make sense to truly become successful, but then to hand over your very soul? What is your soul truly worth? Let's pray. Father, I believe with all my heart that the message that you give to us is a message of life. It's a message of encouragement. It's a message of love. And I also believe, Father, sometimes we get distracted from realizing how much you love us, how much you've given to us, how much you've invested in us. Father, I pray before all these witnesses this morning, that my heart might become more in tune to you. That my stewardship would be a stewardship that focuses first and foremost on you. That we at Belgrade Avenue United Methodist Church would become a church that stands in a beak, as a beacon in the world, not of success in world standards, but success because of people who are invested and devoted to you and to each other. Lord, I pray that if nothing else comes out of this morning, we might go home asking ourselves, how important you really are to us. And may your spirit begin to move in our hearts, to move us, not to perfection, because we'll never be there. That's why Christ came. But that your spirit would move us closer into relationship to you. Thank you, Father, for being here this morning and for your spirit speaking to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.